We left off talking about movements of the small intestine. We talked about segmentation, which is a mixing movement. Um, and then we talked about peristalsis, which propels things forward through the small intestine. We also have a couple reflexes um, that are involved with moving food through the small intestine and into the large intestine and kind of keeping everything moving when we've got a meal coming in. The gastroenteric reflex, reflex stimulates the motility along the small intestine um, to push everything through the small intestine and then from the small intestine into the large intestine. This is stimulated when food starts to move from the stomach into the duodenum. Okay, when, a, when a stomach is releasing something into the duodenum, that pretty much says, okay, I've got a big meal here. Right? I had this whole big bunch of food and I'm gonna start putting it into the small intestine. So the gastroenteric reflex tells the small intestine, okay, push this all through and make room because there's a lot more about to come your way from the stomach. Um, and this kind of happens in cycles, it's kind of cyclical. So initially what happens is we see that gastrin and secretin and cholecystokine are released. So the gastrin is going to stimulate movement from the stomach to the small intestine and then the small intestine to the large intestine. So literally like the relaxation of the sphincters and contraction of the organs so that little bits go from stomach to small intestine through the pyloric valve or pyloric sphincter and then from the small intestine to the large intestine through the ileocecal valve or um, ileo orifice. So initially that's what happens. Um, the cholecystokinin and um, the secretin, remember we said stimulate the pancreas and then the liver and gallbladder. So that's also important because remember what's happening is we're taking stuff, um, we said from the stomach into the small intestine. So what do we have to do right when we put that chyme in the small intestine? We have to neutralize the acid and start to digest it. So in that case, we need to get stuff from the liver and gallbladder, we need to get stuff from the pancreas and put everything into um, that mixing bowl. Okay, so the gastrin is gonna be stimulating the movement and the secretin and cholecystokinin are initially going to be um, stimulating the secretions and the release of everything into that mixing bowl. Now that's what happens initially. Um, eventually though, remember I said that this was cyclical, kind of happens in little cycles. After that, what happens is that we're gonna actually inhibit gastrin secretion. Um, and inhibiting that gastrin secretion is important because remember we said that gastrin stimulates the motility and the relaxation of those valves. So um, what this kind of does is it gastrin gets released and we relax the valves and everything gets pushed forward. Then we inhibit gastrin and the valves contract. Then gastrin gets released, we relax the valves, we move something forward, and then we inhibit gastrin and it contracts. So what that guarantees is that we move little bits at a time. Because remember, the stomach is big, it's this big storage sack, and we can put a whole big meal in it at once, but we can't do that with a small intestine. We wanna release a little bit into the duodenum and then take care of that then release a little bit and then take care of it. So that's why we kind of have this cyclical release of gastrin, um, where we have gastrin, it stimulates motility and then we inhibit it. We have gastrin, it stimulates mo um, motility and then we inhibit it. The gastroileal reflex is just referring to where gastrin is working at the ileocecal valve or ileal orifice. And again, that's just the materials going from the end of the small intestine into the large intestine. Okay, so overall gastrin is motility. Gastrin is moving things forward from the stomach um, into the small intestine, from the small intestine into the large intestine. And then secretin and CCK are um, for secretions. So that brings us to the pancreas. Um, we looked at the pancreas a little bit already when we did endocrine, but we'll look more at its exocrine functions now. So the pancreas, remember, is an abdominal organ that lies directly behind the stomach. Okay, so just posterior to the stomach in the left upper quadrant. Um, when we look at the pancreas, remember it kind of has this head, neck, body, and tail. So it's got this big round head and it tapers off. Um, and the head of the pancreas sits right in the curve of the duodenum. 
So like you have the curve of the duodenum like this and the head of the pancreas sits right in there and then the pancreas tapers off towards the left side, left lateral side of the body and the tail ends at the spleen. Uh, when we look at the pancreas again, it has endocrine functions and then it also has exocrine functions. The endocrine pancreas um, is a really, really small part of the pancreas. It's only like 1% of the pancreas. Um, but the endocrine pancreas releases hormones, right, from the pancreatic islets or islets of Langerhans. Um, and that releases hormones like we talked about um, insulin and glucagon, which are really important for glucose metabolism or glucose concentrations. Um, there's also pancreatic peptide, there's F cells, there's um, uh, delta cells, but we're, we really focus on the, the glucose. Today we're going to talk about the exocrine pancreas though. The exocrine pancreas is what makes the digestive secretions that get released into the lumen of the GI tract. When we look at the exocrine pancreas, we see that we have acinar cells. Okay, so these little kind of circles or groups of acinar cells. And then we've got a bunch of epithelial cells that make up the duct. Because remember, exocrine secretions get secreted through a duct onto some sort of an epithelial surface. So we'd secrete this, these pancreatic secretions or this pancreatic juice, remember, into the duodenum, into our mixing bowl. So when chyme comes from the stomach to the duodenum, the pancreas releases its pancreatic juice into the duodenum as well. Here we see the pancreas. Um, this is showing us endocrine cells here. Like these would be endocrine. And then all of these are exocrine. So this is really what we're focused on right now. Um, these are called acinar cells, A-C-I, acinar cells. Um, we also call this whole group acini, so like a pancreatic acini, A-C-I-N-I, -I, um, referring to the group of acinar cells. And then you see all of these are just epithelial cells that are lining this duct. Remember when we look at the pancreas, we have the main pancreatic duct going down the center of the pancreas, and then there's an additional accessory duct at the very end, um, right when we get to the duodenum. But essentially, these cells are going to make the pancreatic secretions, the pancreatic juice. It's going to get released into the duct and flow through the duct until it gets released into the duodenum. So the pancreas releases another liter or 1,000 mLs of fluid into the duodenum. or into the GI tract. So again, we have tons of fluid, right? We have a liter and a half of saliva. Um, in the stomach, we put another liter and a half in. In the uh, um, small intestine, we put two liters in. Here from the pancreas, we're putting another liter in. Lots and lots of fluid going into the GI tract. So water is extremely important for digestion. When we look at the pancreatic juice that gets put um, into the duodenum, we see that it's I mean, most in water, right? There's lots and lots of water. Um, we also have what we call carbonates. So the pancreatic juice has carbonates present. And these carbonates are very important because they neutralize acid. Remember the chyme coming from the stomach is acidic. We put it in the duodenum and we've got to neutralize that acid quickly. The pancreatic juice is really important for that. Okay, it's full of carbonates. Carbonates neutralize the acid before the chyme gets pushed on to the next sections of the small intestine. We also have numerous different enzymes. The pancreas makes lots and lots of different kinds of enzymes that help us to further digest food. Um, we see pancreatic alpha amylase. This is kind of like salivary amylase. Remember salivary amylase was in the saliva and it broke down carbohydrates. So pancreatic alpha amylase also breaks down carbs. It breaks down large polysaccharides like starches into smaller disaccharides and trisaccharides. Pancreatic lipase breaks down lipids. Okay, so triglycerides into fatty acids and smaller lipids that are more easily absorbed. Again, 
and lipase is an enzyme that breaks down lipid pancreatic because it's coming from the pancreas. Nucleases break down um, RNA and DNA and the individual nucleotides. Um, when we look at nucleases, we've got a couple different classifications of them. Um, we have ribonuclease and we have deoxy ribonuclease. Ribonuclease breaks down RNA into the individual nucleotides. Deoxyribonuclease, you can imagine, breaks down DNA into the individual nucleotides. And then we can further break down those nucleotides, remember, into their sugars and bases um, once we utilize the brush border enzymes. Proteolytic enzymes, again, lysed proteins, right? So they're gonna break down proteins into smaller peptides and amino acids. And then those peptides can get broken down even further um, when we get into the brush border enzymes. Remember, we already mentioned this before, but um, the pancreatic proteolytic enzymes, so the enzymes that come from the pancreas and broke down, break down proteins are secreted inactive. Right, they're secreted as proenzymes that are not active. And they only get activated after reaching the small intestine. Now the small intestine releases enteropeptidase, and that enteropeptidase is gonna activate um, these proteolytic enzymes. The reason for that, again, is that these proteolytic enzymes break down proteins. We don't want them to actually break down the pancreas and the cells of the duct. We want them to wait and break down proteins in the um, intestine itself. So like, if I released a proteolytic enzyme right here, what do you think this cell's made of? Tons of proteins, right? This whole duct is made of tons of proteins. So if I release an enzyme right here that's gonna eat up proteins, it's just gonna destroy this whole thing. So we release it as something that's not active. And it doesn't start working until it gets out into the lumen of the intestine. Um, and in that case, it's in the lumen, it's surrounded by, by digestive pro um, proteins that we can actually break down, or things that we ate that we need to break down. And the cells that line the intestines have mucus there to help separate from them. 